Good afternoon. Uh, let me just start by uh, making sure that uh, you all know that earlier today, uh, the State Department held a ceremony out at Andrews Air Force Base to commemorate the 500th humanitarian airlift mission to the new independent states of the former Soviet Union. Uh, First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton was uh, uh, scheduled to participate in the send-off ceremony. The senior DOD official was uh, uh, Dr. Ted Warner, who is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Requirements, and under his office also falls the Peacekeeping and Humanitarian Assistance Programs. Uh, this State Department program, uh, which uh, has delivered over $1.8 billion in privately donated and Department of Defense uh, excess medicines, medical supplies, food, and clothing since 1992 under the auspices of uh, Operation Provide Hope is funded under the uh, Freedom Support Act. Um, there was a U.S. Air Force C-5 Galaxy aircraft, uh, which was involved in this uh, current mission. Uh, it is scheduled to deliver approximately $7 million, uh, million dollars in privately donated medicines and medical supplies that will be distributed to people in the outlying regions of Ubikistan. Uh, Ambassador Richard Morningstar, who is the special advisor to the President and Secretary of State on U.S. assistance to the newly independent states, is going to be accompanying this flight to uh, Tashkent. Additionally, there are some members of uh, private voluntary organizations responsible for acquiring and distributing the medicines, representatives of uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers that donated products, and a 25-member military uh, medical team also on board this flight. And uh, some of you may have had reporters out there, but I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. And with that, I'll be happy to try and answer some of your questions. Jane. Uh, could we ask you a little bit about uh, Secretary Cohen's statement uh, this morning in Bahrain about the latest Iranian military capability and air-launched version of the uh, anti-ship cruise missile? How much of it does this increase Iran's military capability <clears throat> in the Gulf? Well, uh, this is another step uh, in the uh, program that Iran has underway to expand its uh, military capabilities. And uh, what the secretary said this morning uh, was that um, certainly by uh, words and by actions, um, Iran suggests that it wants to be able to intimidate neighbors and to interrupt commerce in the Gulf. Um, and uh, the secretary also made it clear that the United States was present in the region uh, and has been for many, many years um, as part of our policy to make sure that this doesn't happen. Uh, now with regard to the overall program, I think you're aware that the uh, Iranians have possessed cruise missiles for uh, over a decade. Um, last year, uh, first of all, I think they, uh, uh, they had uh, used uh, ground launch cruise missiles uh, during the Iran-Iraq war. And in fact, uh, uh, one of the missiles struck a freighter during the uh, war, and I think you recall that incident. Um, last year, the, uh, uh, the Iranians acquired uh, their first ship-launched version, which was a Chinese missile called the C-802. And a uh, with this latest uh, test, they have uh, started working on another version, which is called the C-801, which is a version which is fired from aircraft. The uh, tests that took place recently occurred on um, the 3rd of June, and then there was a second test on the uh, 6th of June. And again, what this was was an air-launched cruise missile. Uh, it was fired from uh, F-4 aircraft. We, of course, have the capability to uh, track 
their cruise missiles. And in fact, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, to destroy uh, cruise missiles in the in the region if they pose a threat to us. But these were tests. Does this, this did this gives test them a, a new dimension of capability, though? Does it not? And is that not a significant concern? Well, it certainly does uh, provide an additional arrow in in the quiver. But at this point, they're working in the test phase. Uh, these, um, as I understand it, the uh, tests were conducted again, uh, against uh, barges, which were um, uh, reflector barges, which enhanced the signature of the, of the target. Does this, did this um, test violate any uh, U.S. policy, any international law, any uh, arms uh, agreements? And the second part of the question did, uh, does the export of this technology, these missiles from China, violate any uh, agreements, U.S. policy or sanctions or anything like that? Is there any violation by Iran in, any, in, in testing these missiles and any violation in, by China in exporting them to uh, Iran? Well, let me first say that, as uh, Secretary Cohen pointed out today, um, uh, the concern that he had and that uh, the United States has with regard to uh, Iran is that they have a, uh, a track record of, um, of uh, exporting uh, terrorism, of uh, uh, at least sounding belligerent toward neighbors, of uh, uh, talking in terms of uh, closing down uh, the Strait of Hormuz, um, all of which does not uh, certainly signal very peaceful motives on the part of uh, the Iranians. Um, now, uh, we also uh, acknowledge uh, that any country has um, uh, the right to, um, uh, to uh, self-defense. Um, and as far as I know, uh, the acquisition of these missiles does not violate any international uh, arms agreements. Yes, Suzanne. What is your assessment about why they have um, uh, acquired them, and do you have any idea how many they've acquired? Well, uh, at this point, I, I just want to say once again that uh, these were uh, some tests that were done uh, the initial tests. I can't give you any idea of how how many uh, missiles they actually have. With regard to um, what their overall motives are, I think that uh, basically uh, the uh, Iranians uh, uh, are interested in um, uh, in developing a military that uh, can um, counter counter any other military in the region. Um, and as I say, they have uh, made statements which uh, certainly uh, would give one the impression that they also uh, may at some point uh, wish to intimidate uh, their neighbors. Um, they also are embarked on uh, the development of uh, weapons of uh, mass destruction, uh, which is a concern that we've had for some time and uh, which has uh, a concern which has been uh, voiced by, um, uh, by the secretary, the deputy secretary, and others uh, in the administration over uh, many years. Doesn't this beg the question of sanctions against China? Well, uh, as you know, we uh, watch very closely um, the uh, transfer of uh, arms technology uh, worldwide. Um, and certainly we are concerned about uh, the transfer of technology that, um, uh, that uh, is in violation of uh, international arms agreements. Um, my belief, however, in this particular case is that this, uh, uh, this particular weapon does not. Uh, but it is of concern to us from a broader perspective uh, simply because it uh, shows an increase in the capability uh, on the part of a, uh, a country that does not have 
a track record that uh, that could be called uh, peaceful. Said in, in this particular case, but what about the uh, case cited in today's Washington Times, uh, which talks about Chinese missile technology of, of a different sort, a land-based uh, short-range ballistic missile capability? Um, uh, as I say, we uh, continue to watch uh, these developments. Uh, we continue to watch very closely the transfer of uh, this technology. Uh, but uh, we are uh, not in a position at this point to make any judgment uh, uh, about uh, the extent of the transfer and, um, and any uh, possible uh, uh, reaction that we may have with regard to the Chinese. Yeah. The U.S. government still believe that Iran is sponsoring terrorism at a a uh, fairly vigorous level, even though they now have had elections and m a more moderate element has come into power? Well, I don't think at this point the, uh, the moderate element that you're talking about uh, has had, uh, uh, had the length of time to, uh, to uh, take effect with regard to policy. Um, as far as I know, there has been no radical shift in uh, certainly uh, any actions that they have taken uh, uh, with regard to terrorism, uh, and to my knowledge, they have not uh, voiced any change uh, with regard to uh, terrorism. Uh, what the Secretary has said uh, with regard to Iran is that uh, he was optimistic that the change in leadership would signal uh, a change in their, uh, in their overall policy, uh, but he is also skeptical. You said a minute ago that uh, the United States has the ability to track these missiles and to destroy them if necessary. Is it fair to say from that that, that this increased capability, if indeed that's what it is, we don't see as any threat to uh, American ships? Well, what I want to, I, I just want to make it clear that we, uh, we are watching this very carefully. Uh, we have forces in the region. The Secretary made it very clear in his press conference today that we intend to be there as long as... Um, as we and uh, our friends in the region feel it's necessary for uh, U.S. military presence to be there, uh, we maintain a very robust uh, military presence in the region, and uh, we will continue to watch developments uh, on the Iranian front, just like we do with the Iraqis. So we don't regard this as any more of a threat than the, Ira the Iranians already present to the We Navy. regard this as, an, as I mentioned before is another arrow in their quiver. And uh, it is uh, certainly something that we are going to be watching very carefully. With the anniversary of Kobar Towers uh, almost upon us, um, does the U.S. government have a clearer picture of the culpability of Iran uh, in that affair? There have been hints by Secretary Perry, by Secretary Cohen, um, by uh, Warren Christopher and Madeleine Albright. What, uh, what is the state of thought on Kobar Towers in Iran? Uh, the state of thought on Kobar Towers is that this is a matter that is still being uh, investigated and that no final conclusions have been uh, made. <laughs> yes? Uh, this morning at the Senate hearings on uh, economic espionage and technology transfer to nations like China, it was stated that there were DOD officials who had things to say on these matters and they were prevented from saying them to that committee uh, in one form or another. And I wonder if uh, you have any clarification uh, to your knowledge. Has there been any DOD policy to uh, prevent uh, uh, people in the department from speaking on these questions uh, to congressional committees or no, uh, as far as I know, any time a congressional committee asks for someone to come up to testify, we uh, provide people to go up and testify. Uh, I think you're also aware that uh, we in the department uh, watch uh, and are, uh, are part of an interagency review of technology that is uh, uh, to be transferred to uh, various countries overseas, but I... I am not aware of anybody who has been muzzled in, con in connection with a hearing up there on the Hill. 
yet. There were some reports that American-made technology, especially with guiding system for missiles, uh, has been transferred to China. And in return, it's been used with those missiles that have been shipped or sold to Iran and Pakistan or other countries. Is any conclusive evidence of American-made technology find its way to Chinese missiles? For, uh, for guidance systems for uh, missiles? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I'd be willing to take the question and see if anybody has any further information, but I'm certainly not aware of anything like that. Uh, on the missile, is this missile, new missile, only can be fitted with F-4 aircraft or other aircraft? I can't say. The test was conducted using uh, F-4 aircraft. That the Iranian using other aircraft to be fitted with this? Don't missile? know at this point. Those are American made F 4s? Uh, as far as I know, we're the only ones that ever made F 4s. Where was the test conducted? Uh, I can't. I can't specify the exact location. I I don't happen to know. It was in it was in the uh, Gulf region though. The Iranians are obtaining their spare parts and maintenance for the F 14 F 4. I don't know. We can uh, we can see if we can take the question. They may have used a little uh, reverse engineering. Do you have the offhand in your briefing uh, notes there the uh, percentage of the world's oil supply that passes through the Strait of Hormuz these days? Mm -hmm. uh, no, but I'm sure that we could get that for you. It's a significant portion. All right, Suzanne. Is the Pentagon being updated on the uh, potential extradition of this uh, gentleman from Canada uh, to Washington? or excuse me, the United States, uh, in terms of the, his uh, possibly giving evidence in the Cobar Towers bomb? That's an interesting way you phrase that question. And <laughs> let me just say that, the, uh, that that matter is one for the Department of Justice, and I would refer you to the Department of Justice for a comment on that case. Yes. Landmines. Uh, <laughs> an issue. Uh, <laughs> The sec uh, Secretary Cohen, when he was Senator Cohen, supported the uh, uh, ban on anti-personnel landmines. Uh, does Secretary Cohen still support a ban on anti-personnel landmines, and what is the DOD policy regarding the ban, the proposed ban? Well, as you know, the uh, Department of Defense is working very closely with other government agencies and also with the international uh, community to pursue a global anti-personnel landmine banned through the, uh, the Conference on Disarmament. Uh, one of the uh, top U.S. priorities in the 1997 Conference on uh, Disarmament session is to establish an ad hoc committee uh, with a negotiating um, mandate on uh, anti-personnel landmines. Uh, the President, uh, on January 17th, uh, decided to take two unilateral steps on this issue. One was a permanent uh, ban on anti-personnel landmine uh, land export and transfer, and uh, uh, also a uh, stockpile cap uh, at the current inventory uh, levels. I think you're also aware that uh, the department has embarked on a, a research uh, and development program to uh, find an effective alternative for anti-personnel landmines, uh, which uh, hopefully will ultimately end uh, in uh, our uh, reliance on anti-personnel landmines in certain military situations. How did, what specifically is the problem with Senator Leahy's uh, uh, bill? What's the Pentagon's objection to, to his plan? Well, uh, my understanding is that, um, uh, that uh, uh, there is a a uh, push to uh, uh, to uh, essentially uh, abandon the approach that uh, the administration um, is pursuing at this point uh, with the, uh, the conference on disarmament, and to go with uh, what is called the uh, uh, the uh, Canadian proposal, uh, the Ottawa process. Now, the problem with that is that the conference on disarmament actually involves a lot of the major uh, producers of landmines, specifically Russia and China. And we believe that 
by including uh, Russia and China, who have made very clear that they are not, at least in the case of the Russians, that they're not willing to participate in uh, the Ottawa process, but will participate in the Conference on Disarmament, and in the case of the Chinese, who have not yet made any decision on the issue, that there is a, a greater chance of total success in uh, ultimately uh, banning landmines altogether. But the, but the Pentagon does not support the Canadian proposal. Well, we don't find uh, the uh, two proposals uh, exclusive. We we believe, and the administration believes, that you can uh, that you could actually pursue this thing on both tracks. And as a result of that, we've had uh, the United States has had observers at uh, at the meetings that have gone on uh, uh, on the Canadian track. But we do believe that the appropriate forum uh, to solve this problem is through the uh, Conference on Disarmament, which is a UN instrument and which involves a much larger number of countries uh, than does the Ottawa process at this point. What is the goal? Is the ultimate t uh, total ban of landmines. Why doesn't the United States or the Pentagon, why doesn't it advocate a unilateral uh, abandonment of, of landmines, or is it believed that there's some bargaining uh, advantage to be gained from holding on to, to some landmines for some certain amount of time? Well, uh, one, in, uh, I think you're aware that in the case of the Korean Peninsula, we believe that there is an important military reason for uh, retaining landmines as part of the, uh, as part of the uh, protection of uh, South Korea. Um, Makes exception for Korea, doesn't? A Korea aside. Well, we just believe that there needs to be uh, an all-inclusive approach to this thing, which can only be accomplished through the Conference on Disarmament. You know, the secretary, the secretary Cohen, support continue to support a ban on landmines as he did when he was. In the secretary Senate. is part of the administration, and as far as I know, he supports the uh, administration's approach on this thing. Does anybody else want? Okay. That's what's becoming a regular question here. Do you know when there will be replacements named for Dr. White and Dr. Kaminsky? No, I do not. Uh, Soon? Are we getting sooner? <laughs> uh, I. Uh, uh, frankly, I have no uh, prediction for you. Of course, we won't make those announcements here. They're uh, presidentially appointed Senate confirmed uh, uh, positions, and my expectation is that the announcement will be made uh, once the uh, president has uh, uh, decided on who his nominee will be for those positions. Do you have a yeah. substantive reaction to the proposal Barney Frank is floating on Congressman Barney Frank? on the decriminalization of consensual sex between military and uh, Mark, I think we want to wait until that actually uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, reported out of uh, committee in the legislative process before we make any comment on that. Neither version of the defense authorization bill that came out of the House and Senate committees would permit uh, a base closing round in 1999. How uh, important to the department is it to get that authorization this year? Could you go and have base closing in 99 if you didn't get authorization this year? Um, that's a good question. I think it's highly unlikely that we would be able to get to the point of uh, BRAC rounds without action uh, being taken um, uh, on this authorization bill. I think, as you know, uh, the secretary has uh, feels very strongly that we need to find um, additional monies for our uh, force modernization program, that we have excess infrastructure and we need to get rid of that. Uh, I think you're aware that we have brought down uh, the uh, uh, base infrastructure uh, in the uh, United States, that is, uh, domestic bases, by 21 percent. Uh, while at the same time we brought down the force structure, that is personnel, by 36 percent. And we think that this is uh, a mismatch that needs to be corrected. We need to get rid of uh, this uh, excess infrastructure simply because we can 
uh, we, we calculate that we can save something on the order of $1.4 billion in every BRAC round. And we need that money to ensure that we have the kind of modern capable force that uh, we project in the quadrennial defense review uh, for uh, uh, 20, uh, the year uh, 2005 and beyond. If you don't get a BRAC in 99, will there have, then have to be further cuts in the modernization program? And can you tell us some about that? Well, what? first of all, I think everybody remembers when uh, the Secretary uh, talked about uh, the uh, quadrennial defense review. Uh, it, it was clear that our calculations for, uh, for the defense budget over the coming years is that the budget is not going to grow in size any, particularly in an era where you've got, uh, uh, you've got uh, balanced budgets and uh, you've got uh, other budgetary constraints that are going to be uh, at play. Uh, we know uh, what size force we need. We know uh, that we are going to have to modernize in order to make sure that we have the kind of force uh, that uh, uh, retains its uh, competitive edge. Uh, the Secretary has said on many occasions, we're not looking for a fair fight. We're looking for an unfair fight. We want there to be no question that if it comes to the point of having to defend, we're going to be in a position to, uh, to uh, immediately uh, and very quickly a win in any battle. And that is uh, why he feels that this modernization program is very important. Now, if you don't have an increase in budget, uh, and if you have uh, an idea of the force size uh, that you're going to need in order to uh, do all the military missions that you've specified in your strategy, uh, there is not a lot of uh, leeway on where uh, money can come from. Right now we're looking to getting rid of uh, of the kinds of, uh, of extraneous costs uh, that we don't need uh, to be paying for. We're looking for economies in uh, the way we do business in, the, in uh, the Department of Defense in order to find those additional dollars. And uh, certainly closing these excess bases is one way uh, to do this. Uh, it is an important way, and that's why uh, we have uh, proposed through the Quadrennial Defense Review uh, to do two additional BRAC rounds. Yes. Before we go, one more question from our uh, Fun Facts to Know and Tell file. Is there any legal bar to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, being from the same service? Is there any requirement that they be from different services, or is that simply a custom? No, there is actually a part of the law specifies that the chairman and the vice chairman will be from different services, except, uh, and there are two exceptions, as I recall. One is in times of war when uh, the uh, president can make an exception. And uh, the other occasion is during times of transition, uh, when uh, there is a new uh, chairman or a new vice chairman. Suzanne. Meaning that that would be a temporary situation? Well, certainly the, uh, the latter uh, situation would be a temporary one. Uh, uh, the uh, law uh, foresees uh, the occasion in a time of war when it might be necessary to have, uh, for any number of reasons, uh, both the chairman and the vice chairman from the same uh, service. Let's make sure that we're, we're clear on this. So, for instance, could Secretary Cohen, if he wanted to nominate an Air Force general to be the next chairman because General Ralston is, is the vice, because General Ralston will be leaving at some point in, in the future, or would it have to be a shorter term? I mean, would he be able to? <laughs> uh, in times of transition, right. I mean, theoretically, you could say the there's a year of transition because because he has a year left on his term or, or something. And so he, you could say, well, he's in the last year. It's a time of transition. Is that just a gray area, or is it pretty clear? Uh, I, I uh, frankly think that uh, there is no impediment, given the uh, schedule of events here, for uh, the uh, president to nominate uh, 
a member of any service that he wants for the position of chairman at this point. Yes, Suzanne. Is there any time frame under which the secretary needs to act in order to get the uh, new chairman confirmed? No. In fact, as I recall, uh, General Shelley Kashvili, when he was nominated for the position, uh, was nominated and confirmed in the same month. Um, and it was uh, the month of September. Uh, so um, uh, it's uh, very clear from everything that I've seen to this point that uh, General Shelley Kashvili intends to retire at the end of September. Uh, so that is the date that is out there that, uh, uh, that I think people are keying on. Thank you. Thank you.